I'm Steve Marshall, an artist and a pastor on staff at Willowbrook United Methodist Church. It is Father's Day in the year 2020, and we are living in the midst of a pandemic that has upended our lives in so many ways. My wife and I continue to quarantine at home. It's been over three months of isolation, as it has been for most of you. It has not been easy. We miss spending time with our family and friends. We had to postpone a long planned trip to Scotland. Summer vacation plans have also been put on hold. It seems during this time of COVID-19, we know that we are only truly safe at home. In the summer of 1960, my family moved from Connecticut to Brooklyn, New York. I had always been a Yankee fan, and so it was a thrill when my dad took me and my brothers to see a Yankee game at Yankee Stadium. As we entered the stadium and made our way to our seats, we stepped out of the covered concourse into the bright sunshine, and I still remember being overwhelmed by the sight of the bright green grass of the outfield and the rich brown dirt of the infield. And I was so excited to see in person my heroes, <clears throat> Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, Whitey Ford, Yogi Berra, and, and so many more. During the game, there was a close play at home plate. After a moment's hesitation, the umpire extended his arms wide and issued his call. The crowd exploded, for the runner was safe at home. Yes, today is Father's Day, and I wish all the fathers a, a wonderful day. And I thought I'd start with a baseball theme to talk about something very important. You know, the whole point of the game of baseball is scoring runs to eventually have the runners be safe at home. And that's the whole point of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Philip Yancey, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, tells this story. A young girl grows up on a cherry orchard just above Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents, a bit old-fashioned, tend to overreact to her nose ring, the music she listens to, the length of her skirts. They ground her a few times, and she seethes inside. I hate you, she screams at her father when he knocks on her door after an argument. And that night, she acts on a plan she has mentally rehearsed scores of times. She runs away. She has visited Detroit only once before, on a bus trip with her church youth group to watch the Tigers play because newspapers in Traverse City report in lurid detail the gangs, the drugs, and the violence in downtown Detroit, she concludes that it is probably the last place her parents would look for her. California, maybe, or Florida, but certainly not Detroit. Her second day there, she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen, he offers her a ride, buys her lunch, and arranges a place for her to stay. He gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. She was right all along, she decides. Her parents were keeping her from all the fun. Well, the good life continues for a month, two months, a year. The man with the big car. She calls him boss, teaches her a few things that men like. Since she's underage, men pay a premium for her. She lives in a penthouse and orders room service whenever she wants. Occasionally, she thinks about the folks back home, but their lives now seem so boring and provincial that she can hardly believe that she grew up there. She has a brief scare when she sees her picture printed on the back of a milk carton with the headline, 
have you seen this child? But by now she has blonde hair, and with all the makeup and body piercing jewelry she wears, nobody would mistake her for a child. Besides, most of her friends are runaways, and nobody squeals in Detroit. After a year, the first signs of illness appear, and it amazes her how fast the boss turns mean. These days, we can't mess around, he growls, and before she knows it, she's out on the street without a penny to her name. She still turns a couple of tricks a night, but they don't pay much, and all the money goes to support her habit. When winter blows in, she finds herself sleeping on metal grates outside the big department stores. Well, sleeping is the wrong word. A teenage girl at night in downtown Detroit can never relax her guard. Dark bands circle her eyes. Her cough worsens. One night, while she lies awake, listening for footsteps, all of a sudden everything about her life looks different. She no longer feels like a woman of the world. She feels like a little girl, lost in a cold and frightening city. She begins to whimper. Her pockets are empty, and she's hungry, and she needs a fix. She pulls her legs tight underneath her and shivers under the newspapers she's piled on top of her coat. Something jolts a synapse of memory, and a single image fills her mind of May in Traverse City, when a million cherry blossoms at once, and the golden retriever dashing through the rows of blossomy trees in chase of a tennis ball. Oh God, why did I leave, she says to herself, and pain stabs at her heart. My dog back home eats better than I do now. She's sobbing, and she knows in a flash that more than anything else in the world, she wants to go home. Three straight phone calls, three straight connections with the answering machine. She hangs up without leaving a message the first two times, but the third time she says, Mom, Dad, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way and it'll get there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus until it gets to Canada. Well, it takes about seven hours for a bus to make all the stops between Detroit and Traverse City, and during that time, she realizes the flaws in her plan. What if her parents are out of town and miss the message? Shouldn't she have waited another day or so until she could talk to them? And even if they are home, they probably wrote her off as dead long ago. She should have given them some time to get over the shock. Her thoughts bounce back and forth between those worries and the speech that she is preparing for her father. Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's all mine. Dad, can you ever forgive me? She says the words over and over, her throat tightening even as she rehearses them. She hasn't apologized to anyone in years. The bus has been driving with its lights on since Bay City. Tiny snowflakes hit the pavement, rubbed worn by thousands of tires and the asphalt steams. She's forgotten how dark it gets at night out here. A deer darts across the road and the bus swerves. 
every so often a billboard and then a sign posting the mileage to Traverse City. Oh God, she thinks. When the bus finally rolls into the station, its air brakes hissing in protest. The driver announces in a crackly voice over the microphone, 15 minutes, folks. That's all we have here. 15 minutes to decide her life. She checks herself in a compact mirror, smooths her hair, licks the lipstick off her teeth. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingertips and wonders if her parents will notice if they're there. She walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect. Not one of the thousand scenes that have played out in her mind could prepare her for what she sees. There, in the concrete walls and plastic chairs bus terminal in Traverse City, Michigan, stands a group of 40 brothers and sisters and great aunts and uncles and cousins and a grandmother and a great grandmother to boot. They're all wearing goofy party hats and blowing noisemakers and taped across the entire wall of the terminal is a computer generated banner that reads, Welcome Home. Out of the crowd of well wishers comes her dad. She stares out through the tears quivering in her eyes like hot mercury and begins the memorized speech. Dad, I'm sorry, I know. Ah, he, he interrupts her. Hush, child, we've got no time for that. No time for apologies. You'll be late for the party. A banquet's waiting for you at home. She's now safe at home, safe in her father's arms. Jesus told a similar story that we call the parable of the prodigal son. In that story, the younger of two sons goes to his father and demands his share of his inheritance. He basically is saying to his father, you might as well be dead. Well, the father agrees and the younger son goes off to a far land where he squanders his money in riotous living, finds himself eventually penniless and hungry to the point where he determines that he would be better off as one of his father's servants. So he returns home. When the prodigal son came to his senses and decided to return home, his father saw him approaching from a distance. And the father then did something that was at that time culturally surprising. Normally a father would wait to be addressed by the son and to receive some indication of respect before responding. But this father didn't wait. The Bible says, and he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Now a man in a robe never ran, for it meant lifting his robes above his knees, which was very undignified and humiliating. And yet the father's love was so great that he was willing to humiliate himself in order to welcome his long lost son home. Jesus concludes the story by saying, this is what God is like, a loving father who is always seeking to welcome us home. And as many of you grandparents have found out, our children are always our children, no matter how old they are. And sometimes they become prodigals, wanting to go home to a safe place. 
That's what the story of the prodigal son is all about. Learning that no matter how far we wander from God, no matter how terrible our sin, no matter how hurt we are, we are safe at home. And the story of the prodigal son is also a story about forgiveness. It's about a wayward son or daughter finally coming home and finding acceptance, finding an opportunity for a fresh start. But it's also our story, for we are the prodigal son and daughter. We have turned our back on God, our Father and gone our own way. We have squandered our inheritance, seduced by the pleasures of this world. But God has not given up on us. God, even now, is searching the horizon, waiting for you to come to your senses, to repent and to come back home. And when you return, there will be joy in heaven, and a great banquet will be waiting for you. For now, you are safe at home. During this difficult time, I pray that you will remain safe at home until the way is clear for us to resume our normal lives. Sue and I miss seeing you all in church. It's been devastating to have to give up worshiping in our beautiful chapel and sanctuary. We miss the fellowship, the hugs, and everything that has made Willowbrook such a special place. Be patient, for this time of trial will eventually end and we will be together again. Until then, May God bless us with his continued presence and give us strength and comfort during this time of separation. My friends, stay strong. Be safe. Amen. <laughs>